said, if God had these attributes, God would be a solution. But I've yet to have the argument for that. There was a final point um, that, that, I, that I want to make, but it just eludes me currently, so I'll stop there. What we'll do, thank you so much, Eusebius. What, what I do want to do is engage the audience a little bit uh, in on the discussion. Uh, remember, you can take a moment now, please, if you have a question, to send through the hashtag uh, CapM, Cap, uh, Cap G, sorry, CapM, Cap W for Vits for your questions. There's some questions already that have come through, uh, starting with you, um, Professor John Lennox. Is it only atheism that undermines science or anything non Christian? Does Islam undermine science also? Well, I would not regard myself as an expert on that, though my colleagues would point out that when it came to the transmission of Greek science in the Middle Ages and so on, the scholars working at the House of Wisdom in Baghdad made enormous contributions <coughs> to doing that. And, uh, and again, I'm not an expert. It would be correct for a Muslim scholar to answer this question. but. Uh, there, t there tend to be, as far as I can see, two strands within Islam on this. Those who are not so favorable towards scientific investigation and others who are. But since that's exhausted my knowledge, I'll stop. Perhaps Eusebius knows more about it than I do. I haven't a clue. No. <laughs> I'm agnostic on the matter. <laughs> so am I, really. That's... Eusebius, a question for you. Uh, what type of evidence would convince you of the existence of God? It's a very good question. I'm not entirely sure. What I do know is that routinely in everyday life, and it gave me an opportunity to expand on a couple of things. This is also, by the way, where some fascinating um, disagreement happens between me and some of my, my atheist friends that I deeply respect intellectually. Let me be clear, and I, and I do care about probability maybe a little bit more than John. Very few of us only have beliefs that are based on absolute certainty of the truth of those beliefs. Mm -hmm. So we do reason probabilistic oftentimes, and then end up believing claims to be true, and acting as if they are certainly true, even if, theoretically speaking, we probably, if pushed in the seminar, agree that we don't know them with certainty. So certainty is not everything in life. In fact, I think a human life would be unrecognizable if you only wanted to believe things with certainty. So I accept that, and that's often where my atheist friends think they are close to converting me to atheism because they say, aha, if you look at the probabilities of whether God exists or not, clearly the case for atheism is stronger than theism, so can you kindly make a jump from being an agnostic to being an atheist? Now, I'm setting all of that up by way of saying that I'm not sure what will convince me, but in my everyday experiences, I know that if we were to take a scientific examination of the contents of this bottle, there's a very good chance that we'll confirm it's H2O. Right? And I want a, kind, a piece of evidence of a similar vein that is consistent with the methods that I use for why I have faith that in the event that I should have full-blown aid, say for example, that ARVs might actually help. I have faith in that because scientists subjected that to all sorts of processes, observing, testing, etc. So that's the kind of experience I probably have. What I thought John would do, uh, but it's not the basis of his account, it seems, at least not singularly, of why he believes in God, is that I often get, the kind of evidence I'm often given is personal acquaintance with God, like an apparition, the experience of a miracle. That kind of experience wouldn't satisfy me because you have to be able to eliminate potential explanations for those experiences that are consistent with more verified facts in science. So for example, if I have to ask you, why is there a greater chance of a God with these attributes that are queer to us, accounting for your experience last night when you saw something, than the possibility of just being mistaken, or having hallucinated, or you drank too much in Melville when you went clubbing? You need to be able to eliminate that. And so I'm never going to be satisfied with miracles, very unlikely. The idea of a personal experience that is not open to verification and testing by others, that is just personal knowledge, I find very odd. So I probably want the kind of evidence that John would give me if I asked him to prove to me and give me a good scientific account 
of why ARVs are effective and I should take them if I was an AIDS patient. That is the, the level of justification I'm looking for. John, would you like to respond as, as one of your next questions was about the evidence that you've given today? Uh, would you like to respond to that? Well, I actually reject the idea that I simply made assertions. You made a lot of assertions. And you've accused me of making assertions, that I'm simply taking in contingent facts from sociology. I don't think I'm doing that at all. I could have unpacked, of course. And you mentioned probability, so let me come back to that. Many of my scientific colleagues, some who are not even Christian, when it comes to the observable uh, fine-tuning of the universe, they think something is going on. And a lot of scientific work has been done through the past 50 years. And you get somebody like Roger Penrose, one of my colleagues, who says, you know, to get a universe like this one, with the second law of thermodynamics, the creator's aim, and those are his words, and he's a humanist, um, has to be accurate to one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123. Now, what interests me is not my reaction to that, but the reaction to high-powered scientists for instance, Arno Penzias, who got the Nobel Prize for the microwave background. And he says, here we have a universe that's so finely tuned, its basic constants so precisely tuned, that we could say, almost say, it has been designed to a supernatural plan. Now, that's just a, not asserting contingent facts, Eusebius. That's a reaction to how science has developed. And I would say that the, the history, which you think contingent facts of history, but the connection between modern science, the rise of modern science and Christian belief, is a fact we have to factor in. It didn't arise in Chinese society, which didn't have, as Joseph Needham saw, and he was a neo-Marxist, it didn't have the unifying principle of a creator. So I, I don't think I'm doing what you say, simply making assertions. And, um, I mean, all I can do is assert back and let the, uh, let the people judge. Now, you mentioned miracles, um, finally, and David Hume. Um, I interacted a bit with Anthony Flew on David Hume and his take on miracles. And Anthony Flew, as you may know, came to the conclusion that Hume was wrong and that he would have to rewrite all of his books. Now, we haven't time to do that. But I take so seriously your point that we have to, in order to believe something like the resurrection of Jesus, and not be gullible for all kinds of things, we have to very powerful evidence. Because by definition, miracles are extremely improbable. But the point is this. I take your point so seriously that I've just published a book, actually, if you don't mind me mentioning it, Winston, called Gunning for God. <laughs> where I devote the last two chapters, one to the in-principle argument against miracle, that is, miracle cannot happen because they violate the laws of nature, which I believe to be false. I think Hume was wrong there. He didn't even uh, believe in the laws of nature because he didn't believe in cause and effect. But also, then looking at, his, looking at the resurrection of Jesus through Hume's criteria for witnesses. And I think that can be done and I think it gives us very powerful criteria for basing an evidence-based faith in the resurrection of Christ. So I simply don't recognize your description of what I've been trying to say. But of course we'll disagree about that. I let the audience judge. <laughs> Can I have a 30 seconds response? 30 seconds, please. I'm perfectly happy to, to not characterize you as being assertive. Uh, that's very rude. Perhaps a better description, which I think you may be happy with, is that the nature of your argument is certainly one based on inference to the best explanation. But I do not accept it as a good inference. So I'm still not happy that it is sufficiently cogent. And the reason for it is, and in the interest of the 30 seconds that I claim, I'm going to be very quick here on this one, can engage anyone in the audience about it afterwards. All the brilliant and interesting work being done by many of the biologists that John, that you're aware of, on this fine-tuning question, Quite frankly, I found that work always as a philosophy student to be sophisticated versions but not actual advancements 
on the watchmaker analogy from centuries ago. It is just a more sophisticated version of saying, if I come across a watch, there must be a watchmaker. If I see a universe that is finely tuned, I must infer that God exists. But there's a clear disanalogy because we know watchmakers exist. We've seen them do it. And there's a basis for suspecting if you come across a watch, there must be a watchmaker. You cannot do the same kind of reasoning in respect to the universe's beauty. And the scientists working on this field might give us a cooler description than the person who uses the watchmaker analogy because they can then talk in scientific and biological detail about the incredible fine-tuning of the human being and the world that we live in. But at the end of the day, to go from there to making the inference an intelligent being exists, that inference is still hasty. Thank you. Um, just some few quick questions. I'm going to ask uh, if you would be... Uh, you just give some quick responses because we, then I'm going to ask you to give some closing remarks in a little while. Um, I know you'd like to hear more, but this is a good advert for next year's event. Uh, Eusebius, very quickly, how do you distinguish between right and wrong if you acknowledge that you cannot account from go, uh, for going from descriptive to normative? Well, with great difficulty, and I'm not ashamed of that. It's one of the reasons why I'm an agnostic in the first place. If there are problems and challenges with intellectual projects, with personal projects, you live them. This is one thing I actually share with John. It's why I've really enjoyed um, getting to know you in a couple of hours. You live them. You wrestle with them. So this is me. I mean, put aside the intellectual part of the conversation. So, so I really have trouble with that. It, it would have been a big part of my work as an academic philosopher if I chose that life. I don't. I think it's really, really difficult to know how to fill in those details. I think some philosophers have succeeded. Uh, Kantian ethics fascinate me, for example. Uh, Kant is an objectivist. I find the categorical imperative a pretty good principle that guides my action as a matter of fact when I think about right and wrong. But the short answer to that question is that, that, that I don't have something that I can pull out of a hat. And I'm very comfortable with that. What I'm not going to do is solve my discomfort and the project that is ongoing personally and intellectually by taking a leap into the arms of a Christian God. Thank you. John, is the contradiction between evolution and the biblical creation story not a good example of the contradiction between science and religion? Ah, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> One minute. <laughs> this is a massive question. Let me put it this way. It depends which evolutionary count you're thinking about. Because uh, we, we are, tend to be confused about evolution. We use it to cover a whole lot of things. Unfortunately, part of the confusion is due to Richard Dawkins, if I dare mention him again. Um, it is blind watchmaker. He said evolution accounts for the existence and variation of life. He's withdrawn that. Evolution has nothing to do with the existence of life because you don't have evolution in any sense going until you have life, so you can leave that out. Secondly, um, there are two issues. First of all, as far as theism goes, I do not think you can deduce the non-existence of a creator on the basis of discovering a mechanism that does something. Uh, and that simply means that you cannot deduce, and you could see that categorically, that you can't deduce a worldview from biology. They don't even fit in the same categories. But secondly, the much more provocative question is whether the current theories of, of natural selection and genetic drift and so on, mutation, can bear the weight put on them. I'm not a biologist, but I read a lot of the stuff, and I'm fascinated uh, what's coming out. I just mentioned one person, James Shapiro, head of molecular biology in Chicago, who's just written a fascinating book, evolution from a 21st century viewpoint. And he says that um, the idea that we get um, improvements in complexity of life by numerous small accumulations is simply false. And the thing that I'm observing as a non-biologist is what is being queried is the adequacy of this putative mechanism to do any more than Darwin observed. He brilliantly observed that you can get pinch beak legs changing and so on, but getting elephants from protozoa is a different matter altogether. Now, as a, wearing my mathematical hat, it seems to me there's a major <coughs> theoretical problem looming. Nagel is bringing one to attention and saying this reductionist view won't do because it won't cope with mind. 
The second problem is this, that all computer scientists know junk in, junk out. And if you regard the living cell as an information processor, which it is at least, then you come up against things like, um, like the church Turing thesis, that a Turing machine, that is any computer at all, past, present or future, cannot generate any information that's not either in its input or in its own informational structure. That seems to me to be threatening the whole naturalism project. So it seems to me the judgment is out. Now you mentioned the biblical view. The biblical view is fascinating because what it says is in simple but utterly <coughs> profound language. Now, you'd want me to justify this and to do that I've written another book about it. But they'll find that out on the internet. The point is this. We have lived to the science, the information age. We've discovered that information is a fundamental non-material quantity that's not reducible to physics and chemistry. That banishes materialism to me forever. But secondly, that what we've got in the biblical simple description, which is another reason that I believe it as a scientist, the focal point of the Bible when it comes to the origin of the universe is and God said, and God said, and God said, updated to the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. All things came to be through Him. So when I approach that and read it, I say this is absolutely brilliant in that sense. It focuses on the fact that the whole creation was built up stepwise and the universe, peace be to human, <coughs> although I'm not sure that he believed this, the universe is not a closed system of cause and effect. And that God fed in information and energy at stages. That's the exact opposite of a mindless, unguided process. Thank you so much, Professor John. Um, I think um, in the interest of our minds, Tonight, I'm going to have to ask Eusebius for your closing four-minute uh, remarks and as well as you, John, afterwards. I thought Winston was neutral. I would have preferred the word brain. <laughs> Three final sets of thoughts by way of closing. I mean, the first is that I hope you've, you've followed, even if you agree or disagree, but at least followed and, and enjoyed some of the exchange between me and John. But to reiterate where I'm coming from overall, whether it be the views about God's existence, connection between God and morality, or a question we didn't touch on today that I, that I want to briefly talk about in my second summation point, questions around meaning, the meaning of life, is that I am profoundly committed, don't always get it right, and I don't desire to get it right, otherwise I'd be a really boring person, but in general, I'm fascinated by whether or not I'm justified to believe anything. And thus far in my life, I've not yet been convinced that there is overwhelming evidence of God's existence, and most of the kinds of arguments I've come across are based on analogies, on inferences, or simply the functional value that a belief in God might have in my life that may be positive, none of which I deny. In fact, I sometimes offer it as a sweetener to some of my Christian friends and say, in response for acknowledging that your belief is unjustified, why don't we agree it's okay to sometimes believe things if they have a functional value in your life? We all do it. Some of us believe in the gospel of the ANC without evidence. <laughs> so that's the first point I want to make, and I think John and I at least share that commitment to evidence. The second point I want to make, it's not a summation point, I just want to sneak in a thought that earlier had escaped my old mind, is if God is not in your moral reasoning. It doesn't follow that you lack hope. I do not know what the concept of ultimate justice means. I think John and I would have to tease that out on another occasion. Maybe on my radio show, John. I don't know what ultimate justice means. But more importantly, a gripe that I have, a friendly gripe intellectually, is the idea that if you're an atheist or an agnostic and you don't believe in God, you couldn't possibly and John doesn't believe this, but many Christians do, sadly. You can't have deep empathy, you can't have a sense of hope, a sense of yearning. You can't hug that person whose shack has just burned down and has lost a family member. 
and someone who's struggling against the state, fighting the police for an illegal arrest or justice for the Marikana workers, the families, people who were killed. You can't have that if you don't have God. It's a profound lie. If you look at the lives of people that you admire, including the ones who are Christian, a lot of what they do isn't intimately connected, the good virtues that they display, to even their belief in God. But the more limited point I want to make is that, of course, an atheistic life is not hollow inside. We may not believe in things like souls. Only some of us must talk about minds. But it certainly doesn't follow that concepts like love, hope, and empathy are something that Christians have a monopoly on. And then the last thing I want to say, which, which is the reason why I accepted to come to this debate, is that I really hope that, that you will appreciate I think one thing that doesn't exist enough in South Africa, which is public debate, it's very different to being on radio, it's different to, to a lecture, and of course it's different to something John and I agreed a little bit earlier as we walked in, is dull even if it has a place, which is the idea of a forum of 10 people and you come and listen to them speak. I think we need more public debate, and I think that's important. And, uh, and in addition to that, what I love about John is the commitment, and we can disagree on whether I think is convincing or not, but we are both committed to an examined life, a critical life is an important part of a worthwhile life, and, and, I, and I certainly hope that that's one thing that, that you will share, that even if you are a Christian, that you should be unsatisfied with not being able to speak about your Christianity with some conviction. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Professor Lennox. Hello. Uh, Eusebius, ladies and gentlemen, one thing I've come to the conclusion tonight is that Eusebius exists. <laughs> and, uh, I've so enjoyed this discussion. I think this is a, a great example of the best and public-spirited, friendly discussion. Summing up very briefly, you're quite right just a moment or two ago to say that my arguments are reminiscent of Paley's. But I happen to think his argument about the watchmaker was brilliant. Not everything he said was brilliant. But you see, the interesting thing is, you say we know about watchmakers, we've no idea about the God, but half a minute, we've got watches in biology. Absolutely brilliant timekeepers. And the point about inference to the best explanation is very simple. When I see evidence of design, particularly semiotic evidence, linguistic evidence in the structure of DNA, I would much prefer an explanation that made sense to one that doesn't. And the God explanation makes perfect sense to me, God who is the Word, as an ultimate explanation, whatever natural processes were involved in the Word that's in every one of the 10 trillion cells, in our body. I think God has left his fingerprints all over the universe in that sense. So I prefer an explanation that makes sense. And when we see anything linguistic, like that word exit over there, even though it's only four letters, we infer an intelligent input, no matter how many automatic processes might have been involved in producing that sign. And I'm just saying the inference from DNA to an intelligence behind the universe is rational while rejecting intelligence goes against every single analogy we know. That's point number one. Point number two is that I do believe you can verify the truth of Christianity. After all, the claim is not simply that there is a God. The claim is that God can be known and experienced. Now, of course, that's a startling claim. But what comes instantly to my mind that when Jesus was here on earth, he said, if any man wills to do God's will, he shall know of the teaching, whether I am from God, speak from God, or speak from myself. So I've made that experiment. I think there's an experiment that one can make. I could say to you, there's a red Maserati sitting outside the door of this lecture theater. We could argue philosophically till the cows come home, as we say in Ireland, and I'd never prove it to you. You have to go and look. Now, I'm not suggesting you're not prepared to, but I'm a skeptic about many things, and so are you, obviously. Skeptine in Greek means to check from a distance. But if you want to get to know a person, 
If I'm ever going to get to know you, you, I've got to give up my distance, and so have you. And what I believe is the case here is that God has given up his distance as creator and become human. We are human, so we can get to know him. But we can only get to know him in the way we get to know other persons, by being prepared to give up our distance and to make the experiment of trusting him. Finally... This one thing. Finally, I agree utterly with Eusebius. It is a slander on atheists, agnostics, and everything else to say that they cannot show empathy. That disturbs me as much as it disturbs you. And ladies and gentlemen, you see, from where I sit, let me go even further. My atheist friends can sometimes put me to shame morally. If you look at the Bible, often pagans put the great patriarchs to shame. Why is that? Now, from where I sit, it's for a very simple reason with which I started. Every man and woman, whether they believe in God or not, is made in the image of God and is therefore infinitely valuable, and we need to be very careful how we treat each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Now, <laughs> cheers, man. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask, I know that regardless of where you stand tonight on the position, I know that we've been led to engage, to examine our lives in terms of what we do believe, what we don't believe, and the reasons for that, what we think, what we don't think, and the reasons for that. But I would like you to, once again, please show your appreciation tonight for our speakers. Please, put your hands together as well. Please. Thank you, you, Eusebius, and thank you, Professor Lennox. Uh, With that, uh, let's close our eyes. I'm joking. Um, (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, please.